Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series, Essays on the Gita by Sri Aurobindo, with our beloved Ranga. We are on uh, page, your page seven. The philosophical system of the Gita begins the sentence. Before we start reading this para, I just refer you to the last sentence of the previous para. Its teaching is universal, whatever may have been its origins. So to sum up until now, whatever he has said, he has said that truth, there are two things. There is an essential truth which is permanent, eternal, infinite and unchanging. Then there are practical truths in the physical world which are representing that one, but these are only representations and they are subject to time and space and social conditions. This is what he is saying. And these are mutable. They go on changing. These values are going on changing. And they are often, uh, these truths are embedded in the social customs and the truths that are applicable at that time in that uh, society. So, these are the two things. So, he has told you some of the things which are there, typically Indian, but which seem to be limited only to the Indians. For instance, the sacrifice, the yajna, that is number one he has discussed. Then the second one he has discussed is the caste system, which is there with another name in most of the countries. There is a gradation in societies. But the caste system seems to be peculiar to India. But he is saying that these things which are temporary and seem to be only local have their universal applications. So the last sentence is, it's teaching, the teaching of the Gita is universal, whatever may have been its origins. And the origins are subject to time and space and social conditions. So keep that in mind. Even that which seems to be local and temporary, time bound, if you go deep into it, you will find it a universal truth. <laughs> now I go to the next paragraph. The philosophical system of the Gita, its arrangement of truth is not that part of its teaching which is the most vital, profound, eternally durable. But most of the material of which the system is composed, the principal ideas, suggestive and penetrating, which are woven into its complex harmony, are eternally valuable and valid. For they are not merely the luminous ideas or striking speculations of a philosophic intellect, but rather enduring truths of spiritual experience, verifiable facts, of our highest psychological possibilities, which no attempt to read deeply the mystery of existence can afford to neglect. Whatever the system may be, it is not, as the commentators strive to make it, framed or intended to support any exclusive school of philosophical thought or to put forward predominantly the claims of any one form of yoga. The language of the Gita, its structure of thought, the combination and balancing of ideas belong neither to the temper of a sectarian teacher nor to the spirit of a rigorous analytical dialectics, cutting off one angle of the truth to exclude all the others. But rather, there is a wide, undulating encircling movement of ideas which is the manifestation of a vast synthetic mind and a rich synthetic experience. This is one of those great syntheses in which Indian spirituality has been as rich as in its creation of the more intensive exclusive movements of knowledge and religious realization that follow out with an absolute concentration, one clue, one path 
to its extreme issues. It does not cleave asunder, but reconciles and unifies. Beautiful the way he expresses. So, so if I may ask, uh, all of these treatises on the Gita, all of the treatises that all the books that have been written on the Gita. Yeah. Sri Aurobindo speaking of them? Yeah, he is also speaking of some of them at least. Some of if them. If not all. He is saying that each one is trying to stress only one aspect. Because the Gita speaks of uh, Sankhya as well as Karma Yoga. So some make it Karma Yoga exclusively. Others say, no, it is Sankhya Truth exclusively. And in the... Uh, in, so far as the yoga systems are concerned, it speaks about Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Karma Yoga. So each one says, oh, the Gita is for Karma Yoga, excluding the others. So Srinivas is saying you should not exclude, it combines all. It is not exclusive. And he has given, we will discuss what those exclusive things are he is talking about. Okay. Now, when he is talking about the philosophical system, its arrangement of truth is not that part of its teaching which is the most vital, profound, eternally durable. Why is he saying this? Because the philosophical aspect is a theoretical aspect, but its ways of the how to do the yoga is eternally valid. The paths are fixed and you have to know exactly what to do to be able to go there. It goes into great detail and tells you how you have to, it goes to the extent of sitting, how you have to sit, where you have to sit, how erect you have to be. All these, it goes into great detail. Your spine, your head, all must be in one line. It must not droop like that. So it goes into this. Uh, you should sit on a seat which is neither too high nor too low. And it must be, you must have a comfortable seat so that you are not distracted. It goes into great detail. So those details are absolutely valid for any yoga. Okay. So, but it does not exclude any. So that's what he's saying. It's a wide ranging. And he has used beautiful words. We'll look at that. So is not that part of the teaching which is the most vital because it combines philosophical systems. It says that it is neither <coughs> Advaita nor is it Vishishta Advaita, nor is it only the Dvaita. It combines all and says all are true at different levels. So, the Dvaita means the individual soul is always separate from the divine soul, but it can have a relation with them. That's a Dvaita philosophy. The Vishishta Advaita is the individual soul can merge into the divine soul, become one with it and yet have a relation. Whereas the other one, the final one, the Advaita philosophy is essentially the individual soul and the divine soul are one. It's a oneness. So there is a, a little bit of an exclusivity in the other systems. And that's why you have all these Advaita, Vishishta Advaita and uh, Dvaita. They're all, they are all, they have a tendency to exclude the others. So Srimadha is saying the Gita is not excluding any. It combines all. So, I go to the next sentence. Uh, next phrase, actually. Mm -hmm. But most of the material of which the system is composed, the principal ideas, suggestive and penetrating, which are woven into its complex harmony, are eternally val valuable and valid. Now, look at the words. The principal ideas, suggestive, and penetrating. They are suggestive. They give you only hints. At the same time, it goes into great detail. It penetrates into <laughs> each thing. Okay, And they are valuable and valid. For they are not merely luminous ideas or striking speculations of a philosophical, philosophic intellect, but rather enduring truths of spiritual experience, verifiable facts of our highest psychological possibilities which no attempt to, re to read deeply the mystery of experience uh, sorry, a mystery of existence can afford to neglect. Anyone who wants to know the subtler truths of existence can't 
avoid these truths which the Gita is giving. That's what he's saying. <laughs> you have to meet them and deal with them. He's giving all the basic ideas. And the, the verifiable facts. Not the it's based on spiritual experience and verifiable facts. And this is exactly the method of science. Science also wants to verify the information and also experience. You must be able to experience it and verify. So, that, so people make a difference between yoga and religion and uh, science, but it's not. The methods are the same. They should be the same. Okay, so of our highest psychological possibilities, which are no which no attempt to read deeply the mystery of existence can afford to neglect. Whatever the system may be, it is not, as the commentators strive to make it, framed or intended to support any exclusive school of philosophical thought or to put forward predominantly the claims of any one form of yoga. He will later on also identify some even uh, Bal Gangadha Tilak uh, went so far as to say that the yoga, uh, the Gita is uh, exposition of karma yoga. He didn't, but uh, it's not only karma yoga; it's also jnana yoga. It's also bhakti yoga. Okay, so the language of the Gita, the structure of thought, the combination and balancing of ideas belong neither to the temper of a, a sectarian teacher nor to the spirit of a rigorous analytical dialectics cutting off one angle of the truth to exclude all the others. But rather, there is a wide, undulating, encircling movement of ideas which is the manifestation of a vast synthetic mind and a rich synthetic experience. So, you experience one aspect of the divine and say that that's the ultimate truth. Gita does not do that. Gita tells you, it goes, this experience is possible, that experience is possible. Undulating. <laughs> A beautiful word. It's not something fixed. Okay? And encircling. It goes into and covers all the different theories which are verifiable in spiritual experience. Okay, so, undulating and uh, encircling movement of ideas which is the manifestation of a vast synthetic mind and a rich synthetic experience. This is one of those great syntheses in which Indian spirituality has been as rich as in its creation of the more intensive exclusive movements of knowledge and religious realization that follow out with an absolute concentration one clue, one path to its extreme issues. It does not cleave asunder, but reconciles and unifies. So here he has spoken of India has been rich in exclusive philosophies as well as inclusive philosophies. So he will discuss the synthesis afterwards in the next paragraph. He will tell you what those synthesis are. Briefly, because it is relevant to what we are saying, the first synthetic system was the Vedas. Vedas. The second system was the Upanishads. The third was the Tantrics. They are all synthetic. They don't. They are not exclusive. And the last is the Gita. And he is not mentioned, but his synthetic yoga is the <laughs> last synthesis of all. So it's synthetic. It does not exclude anything. Whereas the excluded things are, we know, the Jaina philosophy, the uh, the Bhakti movement the Vaishnava trends, uh, Shaivism, Vaishnavism, they are all exclusive. So India has been rich in both, he is saying. In the exclusive systems as well as the... And he is not saying that the exclusive systems are wrong. In fact, you can reach your goal through them. But you will get only one aspect of the divine. Whereas if you follow the synthetic system, you will get different aspects of the divine. If you go through Jnana Yoga, you will get knowledge of the divine. If you go through... Uh, the path of devotion and love, you will get devotion for the divine and love for the divine, intimacy with the divine. And if you go through karma yoga, it will give you the nature of the divine. But Sri wants you to combine all, the, all of them. 
okay then there is the buddhism and jaina system then the mahavada systems which give you only the impersonal aspect of the divine but shramda wants you to get the personal aspect of the divine also so that is there in the gita it is there in both that's why it is synthetic okay strong words it does not cleave asunder that's right ah the word cleave is interesting in english yes. it has two opposite meanings <laughs> cleave means to cling to something okay but it also means to cut <laughs> and in this sense it's cut yes here mm. it is being used in the sense of cut yes <laughs> it's one of those very interesting words which to do that okay in sanskrit this is very common hmm because they go from one level this implies this this implies this this implies this and finally you have the opposite meaning it's not uncommon in sanskrit at all oh. but you have to uh, see the context and then apply the right meaning okay so the last sentence is the gita does not cleave asunder but reconciles and unifies okay so the thought of the gita is not pure monism although it sees in one unchanging pure eternal self the foundation of all cosmic existence nor mayavada although it speaks of the maya of the three modes of prakriti omnipresent in the created world nor is it qualified monism although it places in the one his eternal supreme prakriti manifested in the form of the jiva and lays more stress on dwelling in god rather than dissolution as the supreme state of spiritual consciousness nor is it sankhya although it explains the created world by the double principle of purusha and prakriti nor is it vaishnava theism although it presents to us krishna who is the avatar of vishnu according to the puranas as the supreme deity and allows no essential difference nor any actual superiority to the status of the indefinable relationless brahman over that of this lord of beings who is the master of spiritual synthesis no, sorry master of the universe and the friend of all creatures like the earlier spiritual synthesis of the upanishads this later synthesis at once spiritual and intellectual avoids naturally every such rigid determination as would injure its universal comprehensiveness its aim is precisely the opposite to that of the polemist commentators who found this scripture established as one of the three highest vedantic authorities and attempted to turn it into a weapon of offense and defense against other schools and systems the gita is not a weapon for dialect dialectical warfare it is a gate opening on the whole world of spiritual truth and experience and the view it gives us embraces all the provinces of that supreme region it maps out but does not cut up or build walls or hedges but uh, sorry hedges to confine our vision that's the end of the paragraph so we'll go to so he is telling that it is not only exclusively monism not mayavada not qualified monism nor is it sankhya nor is it vaishnava theism so we'll look at all these and see what they have to what they are actually okay so the thought of the gita is not pure monism so pure monism is advaita and advaita is advaita there is no tunel there is only oneness there is only everything is the divine there is spirit and matter you may say they seem to be different but actually everything is only essentially divine that's the advaita philosophy okay so pure monism so it is not pure monism it admits also dvaita okay that's what he's saying 
although it sees in one unchanging pure eternal self the foundation of all cosmic existence so the cosmos is real but it is founded in the self the advaita philosophy okay. then he says nor is it mayavada mayavada is the one that speaks of the physical universe as being only images not reality okay so he says even that it speaks of although it speaks of the maya of the three modes of prakriti omnipresent in the created world the created world is the physical world and the three modes of prakriti are matter life and mind or if you want to use the uh, other terminology sattva rajas tamas okay so so it is uh, it is not mayavada although it speaks of maya okay nor is it qualified monism he is using the english term qualified monism vishishta advaita vishishta advaita refers to ramanuja of the 14th 15th century uh, he was in uh, the on the banks of the uh, kaveri uh, sri rangam even today it is there and they say that he his body is covered with thick layers of uh, chunam his body was not uh, cremated so and he was considered a very great philosopher and his was the path of love but also advaita you can have a relation with the divine but you can also unite with him both are possible according to him advaita philosophy sorry vishishta advaita and they also use the words bheda 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 abheda difference and yet oneness if you have difference you can have a relation and if you have no essentially one then there is no relation possible you are that you are that but in this you can have both for relation you need to yeah uh, you can't have relation with one yes, yes. so but this is what they say both are possible okay then there is the madhvacharya and the others also are there who say no the individual soul can have a relation with the divine eternally it can have a relation a beautiful relation of love and intimacy and but it will be a relationship dvaita philosophy in christianity it would be called sons of the divine yes in christianity dvaita philosophy in christianity it is dvaita you can never this individual being can never become the divine <laughs> that was the this question has been dealt with at great detail in one of amal's books okay there was a, a christian priest who turned to advaita philosophy and he has an ashram near tanjavur in the south he had he is gone now his name was b d griffiths b e d e griffiths i am not sure whether he, i think he was english and uh, there is an institute in germany also with that name so he had a lot of correspondence with him and griffiths is insisting that relation is possible but not the <laughs> so and uh, amal was trying to convince him that it is there so this is a hey, whole book is there hmm. and the book is called um a follower of christ and a disciple of sri aurobindo <laughs> interesting yeah because i met one man also and he was a friend of arabinda basu uh-huh. and he came and gave a talk at our retreat in south carolina okay and he told us that when he was staying at park guest house sri arabinda would materialize in front of him and he said when i went to the airport again sri arabinda materialized in front of me and he first talked about teod de shadar yeah. and nobody got anything and then he talked about his relations with sri arbindo and everyone embraced him and when he got up he knelt before the pictures prostrated himself before sri arbindo and mother and then he said i now call myself an arbindonian christian <laughs> he was a foreigner yes it could an have Ameri- been this man an american Oh, he was an American. He was an American. <laughs> an Arabian-Dominican Christian. Shrevna would have no objection to that. No. <laughs> Because he is <like> inclusive. <laughs> What is the name of this gentleman? Donald Gergen. 
Donald G O E R G E N Gergen. Ah. <laughs> okay. So we read further, okay? So mm-hmm. the Gita is not pure monism nor Mayavada. Mayavada is the theory that says that the physical world is unreal. And the only reality is the self, the Brahman or the Atman. You can use different words. What is it? You, if you want to go beyond words, it's a consciousness that is eternal, infinite, immutable. It never changes. It's permanent, but static. It does not move. That is the, because it's perfect, doesn't need to move. It's like a sea which is absolutely at rest. This is the self and that's the reality. But when this sea of substance starts moving, it creates a world. The world is movement and the Brahman is no movement at all. Static and dynamic. So that's the Mayavada philosophy. That which is moving is not real. It is temporary. But the term Prakriti arises out of Brahman? Prakriti comes out of Brahman in some philosophies. Ah. Not all. Some, for instance, Sankhya sees it as eternally separate. Purusha and Prakriti, we'll come to that. We'll, he mentioned uh, Sankhya, we'll come to that. Okay. So, Mayavada, mm, it speaks of Maya as the three modes of nature. The three modes of sorry, Prakriti. The three modes are Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. The principle of Tamas is darkness, okay, non-consciousness, and static condition. No energy also. That's a Tamas. And that's necessary. Because if that is not there, all forms in the physical world will be moving all the time. So you need something that stabilizes and does not allow free movement. So tamas is necessary. If tamas were not there as a principle of stability and permanence, you will go on changing. And I am talking to you, but you will go on changing your form. That is most impractical. So tamas is necessary. But it is the lowest. It is a darkness. It is static condition. Then you have the opposite, which is the rajas. Rajas is the principle of energy, action, movement, power. Okay, the uh, uh, the uh, will and desire. This is the rajas, but it often goes into wrong actions. It's full of energy and desire. Then you have the principle of sattva, which is the principle of enlightenment, balance, harmony, comprehension, consciousness. That's it. So these correspond to the mind, the vital, and the body. So that's the three. Um, Three modes of Prakriti. Okay? Prakriti is nature. Omnipresent in the created world. Nor is it qualified monism. Qualified monism is, as I said, Ramanuja's philosophy of the Vishishta Advaita. Okay? So, he says it is not even that. It admits its truth but does not use it exclusively. Although it places in the one, his eternal supreme Prakriti, manifested in the form of a jiva and lays most stress on dwelling in God rather than dissolution as the supreme state of spiritual consciousness. So we'll go into this a little bit, okay? So so it is not qualified monism. It is not only Ramanuja's philosophy of Vishishta Advaita, special Advaita it means. Although it places in the one, the highest level, he is eternal supreme Prakriti. So, in the in Gita, it is like the in Satchidananda, there is consciousness as well as force. Consciousness is Purusha and force is Prakriti. And they are one at the highest level. In the one, they are both there. Purusha and Prakriti are both there. That the Gita accepts. And in the supramental... In the supramental, supramental is the power of the divine, of Satchitananda, to create the world. Maya is its power to create the world. Give form to the formless. That's the supramental. That supramental has that power. 
<clears throat> if the supermental were not there, Sachinada would never create the world. It is the supermind that creates the world with its power of Maya, giving forms to formlessness. And there also two uh, philosophies are there. One philosophy says the forms created are unreal. The other says the forms created are real. Behind the form, you will see the reality. Okay? Like the, uh, as we said yesterday, the photograph and the person concerned. The person concerned is the reality. The photograph is the representation. It's not the absolute truth. So, the world is a representation of the one final reality. So, these are all different philosophies depending on what they have experienced and they feel that that's the only truth. <laughs> okay? So, so, note this carefully. And the word jiva means the individual soul. The individual soul is the jiva. Okay? Or they also refer to it sometimes as the jivatman. Okay, so he is eternal and supreme prakriti, manifested in the form of Jiva and lays most stress on dwelling in God. That's the Saloki Mukti. You are living in the divine rather than in your body. You are not living in the body, you are living in the divine. That's what the Gita stresses on. Rather than the dissolution as the supreme state of spiritual consciousness. The dissolution of the body-mind life is what the Mayavadin is recommending. Don't bother about your body, mind, life. Go to the Supreme and live there. Okay? But give up this. But the Gita says, be in the body, mind, life, but live in God. <laughs> so, that's the... Like the... Uh, the uh, image given is a beautiful image in the Gita. The lotus leaf in water. The lotus leaf in the water. It is living in the physical world, not getting wet. It doesn't. It is not affected by the imperfections of the physical world, although it is living there. So, that's what the Gita is saying. Then he says, rather, nor is it Sankhya. The Sankhya philosophy is the one that gives the uh, idea of the uh, Tamas, Rajas, Sattva. It speaks of the three planes as separate and it also speaks of consciousness and force as being eternally separate. They are together, they are acting together, but they are separate principles. Consciousness and force. Whereas the Advaita philosophy says, it is true that at the lower levels they are different, but at the highest level they are one. They are not different. It's not that they are together in the highest level. They are one. Consciousness itself is force. And that force is conscious of itself. It's not that there is a consciousness and a force and they are cooperating. No. It's not that. It is bayun. It's not this and that. This plus this. It's not that. It is bayun. One involved in the other. Okay. So, then he's saying, so Sankhya philosophy, we might touch upon that very briefly. The basic idea is, that Purusha, Consciousness and Force, only Consciousness will not be able to create. Because it's only Conscious, it is static. But Force can create, but it has no knowledge of what to create. It can create chaos, <laughs> but it won't create something uh, rational and meaningful. So, Consciousness has to use Force to create something which is meaningful. So, that's the Sankhi philosophy. And they use the uh, image of the blind man and the lame man. The blind man, he can walk. He has got power. That is Shakti. It's force. But the lame man has got eyes. He can see, but he can't walk. <laughs> so, that's the consciousness and the force. So, when the blind man, sorry, the lame man sits on the shoulders of the Blind man, he has got legs, so now they can move. So the man sitting on top tells him where to go and what to do, then they can cross the forest. <laughs> That's the Sankhi philosophy. But they are eternally separate. Whereas in the Advaita philosophy and Siddhartha philosophy, they are one at the highest level. They seem to be different here. Consciousness and force are not always in human beings. I may be conscious of something 
I may have the knowledge of something, but I don't have the will to do it, or I may not be able to do it. Whereas I am full of energy and I want to do something, but I don't have the knowledge. So at this level in the physical world, they are separated. But as you keep climbing higher and higher in consciousness, at the highest level, they are one. Where does tamas come in in this hierarchy? Tamas. Tamas. At the lowest. So, if one has the will to do something, but not, you have to go to the life plane, because there is a gradation. Na? Yes. There is first matter, mm -hmm. which is tamas. Yes. Matter is unmoving; it is dead. But when life comes in, then it allows movement. So it takes up matter and allows movement. Then you have living creatures. But there is no thought as yet. So mind has to come in and. Then you have a thinking animal. So there is a gradation. So tamas is at the lowest level. And all these forces, mind, life and matter, are all involved in the inconscient. The highest plunges itself and concentrates itself into the inconscient and from there the evolution is taking place. That is the... Instead of though, all these things become very clear. Okay? So... So, it is not Sankhya, although it explains the created world by the double principle of Purusha and Prakriti. But there is a difference in the uh, traditional Sankhya and there is a difference of Sankhya in, in the Gita. We will come to that later on. Okay? Nor is it Vaishnava Theism. Vaishnava Theism, okay? Vaishnava Theism is the worship of Krishna, who is a avatar of Vishnu. So, Vishnu, Vaishnava is the adjective of Vishnu and theism. So you believe in Sri Krishna and you have devotion for him. The basic, uh, the Vaishnavas have a devotion for the for Sri Krishna and they worship him. Whereas the others are Shaiva, okay, they are the ones who worship Shiva. So there are Shiva temples and there are Vaishnava temples and there is a little bit of a Mild quarrel, you can say, between them. Okay? So, although it presents to us Krishna, who is the avatar of Vishnu, according to the Puranas. Okay? In fact, it is Sri Krishna who is sitting in the chariot and giving the advice of the Gita to Arjuna. <laughs> okay? As the supreme, uh, the uh, avatar of Vishnu, according to the Puranas. As the supreme deity, Krishna is the supreme deity and allows no essential difference nor any actual superiority to the status of the indefinable relationship, relationless Brahman over that of this Lord of beings who is the master of the universe and the friend of all creatures. So, Vaishnavasism be believes in the personal aspect of the divine. Whereas the Supreme Deity, okay, the Brahman, is the knowledge aspect. It is the impersonal aspect of the Divine. So usually the Jnana Yogis, they feel that oneness is superior to duality and so they say knowledge is more important than love. But Sri Yavadu does not admit that. He says they are two different things altogether. Both are valid. You can't compare apples and oranges. They are different. The indefinable, relationless Brahman. Note the word, indefinable, relationless. So usually we refer to the indefinable as featureless. You can't, it doesn't have any features to describe. This is the Brahman consciousness. Relationless, only one. Over that of this Lord of beings, the personal aspect of the divine, who is the master of the universe and a friend of all creatures. So this is the other aspect of the divine who is the friend and he is a friend and a master also. This aspect is not there in the Judaism either. In Judaism you have the king who, who, who can punish you. But the idea of punishment is not there at all in the Vaishnava theory. He is a friend and he will help you. <laughs> okay, so. Like the earlier spiritual synthesis of the Upanishads, this later synthesis at once spiritual and intellectual, avoids naturally 
every such rigid determination as would injure its universal comprehensiveness so the gita admits the personal as well as the impersonal it doesn't make a difference between them okay its aim is precisely the opposite to that of the polemist so who is a polemist a one who engages in controversies controversies and debates he is a polemist he is one who argues for one and denies the other so sirmde is saying the gita is the attitude is the opposite of the polemist commentators who found this scripture this scripture established as one of the three highest vedantic authorities the vedanta philosophy they say is a combination of three things the upanishads the brahma sutras and the gita but then they are putting it in the vedantic philosophy whereas sirmde is saying is not necessarily vedantic it's also dvaita <laughs> it's also sankhya partly so gita although it is used in this sense because it does not deny the vedantic truth but does not deny either the other truths <laughs> okay so vedantic authority and attempted to turn it into a weapon of offense and defense against other schools and systems this was very common in ancient india the courts of kings in ancient india the king was the he was looking after the whole population and the his subjects so all these things music philosophy spiritual discussion everything is to take place in the courts of kings so there they are full of all uh, debates between the different systems so this is what sumle is saying that they used to use it as offense and defense against other schools and systems now sumle is very clear categorical statement the gita is not a weapon for dialectical warfare dialectics is that which says it takes one side puts the other side also the uh, purva paksha and the uttara paksha this is a well known uh, principle in indian philosophy you state one side and then you say the opposite and then argue out your case whether you synthesize them or you prove your case this is the one aspect for instance you can take the personal aspect of the divine and the impersonal aspect of the divine and start argument between the two there is the dialectical method so what is the difference in polemics but what is the difference in polemics oh no it's basically the same thing basically <laughs> the same yeah but in dialectics you are trying to uh, work it out in the dialectical the usually the dialectical method is you take the sentence and try and get a synthesis uh -huh. whereas in the polemics it is not <laughs> you remain separate okay so it is a gate it's not a weapon for dialectical warfare it's a gate opening on the whole world of spiritual truth and experience note that constant stress on the experience and the view it gives us embraces all the provinces of that supreme region it maps out but does not cut up or build walls or hedges to confine our vision so look at that first of all there is a cutting up totally separate or it is not cutting up and rejecting but building walls both exist but there is a difference between them or that wall can also become a hedge <laughs> so this is very interesting from those we have uh, discussing there can be three levels of disagreement one is not true true that's the cutting up then the building of walls okay i am not rejecting you as totally false but you are separate i build a wall <laughs> the other one is maybe there's a little bit of an overlap it's a hedge <laughs> way sam the puts is he always puts his gradation of all the possibilities so here also you can see that cutting up number 1 building walls number 2 building a hedge number 3 okay to confine our vision the gita does not do that it neither builds walls nor cuts up nor builds a hedge so we we'll stop here today yes and we'll take it up next time there have been other synthesis thank you rama namaste namaste all